So my name is uh, Javier Ruiz. I'm a senior advisor on digital rights for Consumers International. It's a global coalition of consumer organizations from all around the world. Uh, we have 200 members in over 100 countries. And we, um, yeah, we are here to today together with uh, Consumers Japan and the APC, the Association of Progressive for Progressive Communications. And we put this workshop together to, um, as you saw, to try to start promoting some collaboration in the region around the issues of data governance. Because as we see, um, the Asia Pacific region has got a lot to contribute and has got a lot of uh, ideas and proposals for how data should work, which are quite uh, influential globally. And we think that you know we want to see more discussion from consumer groups and grassroots organizations on this topic and also to connect these debates with some of the discussions taking place as well. So we have some colleagues here from Austria and from elsewhere coming to also talk about what's happening. So I'm just I'm going to let um, Amy Cato to introduce Consumer Japan and then Paula. And then after the brief introductions, we will start with the speakers. And just to give a very brief uh, order of the day, we are going to be very, we are not going to keep a totally regimented timetable. We are going to try to be flexible depending, but the idea is roughly that we are going to have one hour of uh, presentations and discussion on the various um, data governance initiatives and policies that are taking place in the Asia Pacific region which includes the cross-border privacy rules, the IPF, DEPA, Digital Economic Partnership, and similar. Then we will have a second block of roughly, possibly an hour, although we may start getting shorter as we go along, mm, looking at national context and what is happening in Japan, what's happening in Korea, and what's happening in other countries in the region. And then uh, the final block would be more like a collective discussion to try to organize uh, some follow-up interventions. So one of the things that we want to see is not just a, a discussion here today, but trying to get some idea for where consumer and digital rights organizations should uh, intervene, trying to engage with uh, policymakers in the, um, on these topics. So I will let now, um, just after a brief overview, I will let um, Amy Kato, you want to just introduce Consumer Japan? Hi, my name is Amy Kato from um, Consumers Japan. Thank you. Hello, uh, good afternoon. My name is Paula Martins. I am Policy Advocacy Lead and Program Manager at the Association for Progressive Communications, APC. APC is a networked organizations organization. <laughs> we have members uh, in 100 and members and associates in 103 um I'm sorry, I'm going to start again because I really got confused with the numbers, so bear with me, <laughs> it's jet lag. <laughs> so APC is a networked organization, and now I'm, gonna, I'm going to get the, right, the, the numbers right. So what we have are 103 members and associates in 74 countries. <laughs> Apologies for that, including some of which are here in the room uh, today and collaborating with this um, conversation. We have uh, 24 members in Asia. Um, most of these members are in the global majority countries, and they are uh, very diverse members. Uh, we all work on the intersections between uh, social, environmental, and gender justice and technology. So they are, broadly speaking, digital rights groups, um, uh, but they uh, really are diverse in, the terms, in terms of the focus that they have uh, in the work that they are doing at the national and the regional level. Um, data is key to a number of them in different ways. So you have gender organizations, you have environmental organizations um, looking at digital uh, issues where data is a, a critical element of the advocacy and the, the policy, the, the capacity building that they are doing. So um, this is central to the discussions that are taking place within our network. And uh, we were really happy to join efforts with, um, with uh, Consumers International to put together this, this um, session. 
um, our view, our idea is really to create a space to share info, to learn more about what's going on in relation to data governance in the region, but also to promote more synergy, including among us, <laughs> um, and the idea of bringing together our networks, our partners working on consumers' rights and digital rights so that we can explore um, concrete joint actions maybe following up to this um, discussion. So um, thank you all for being here and joining us today. Um, it is um, a pleasure to be here in Kyoto. Thank you, Paola. So now, first, uh, our first uh, presentation today uh, is going to be Dr. Uh, Minako Morita Jaeger, who is a senior research fellow at the inter on international trade at the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom. And she's going to give us an overview of the um, data governance from there, based on her research. So please, Minako. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Um, so my the PowerPoint. Oh, yes. You can, yeah, you can thank you very much. Oh, yeah. oh, then maybe I can. Uh, oh. oh, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Minako Morita Yiga. Um, I'm based in the UK. Uh, I'm still, I just came to Japan two days ago, and uh, I'm still suffering jet lag. If I fall in sleep in the middle of my talk, <laughs> give me a shot, but very gently, <laughs> please. Um, so that um, I'm going to just give you a very, you know, that the wider picture of what is going on at international level. Um, so the, uh, I'm working at the University of Sussex. Also, we had that kind of think tank with the um, co-established together with the Chatham House. We had the UK Trade Policy Observatory, where I'm doing the research uh, policy policy research for that. And then um, also that the Center for Inclusive Trade Policy. We are promoting the trade policy for all stakeholders equally. And uh, because I'm trade policy expert, I'd like to just uh, explain that kind of the, um, the linkage between the data governance and trade as well. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I think you know very well, but uh, wh wh what is data governance? And the definition here is um, maximizing opportunities while protecting the rights. That is the governance. And then, but according to World Bank, sorry, it's not from the United Nations, but <laughs> not only good, um, good data management, but establishing norms and rules about rights, principles, and obligation around the use of data. Multi-stakeholder approach is a key for the data governance. This is why we are gathering here today. So that when we think about data governance, so this is a kind of a welcome to the world of tech hegemony. So there, well, the, in academia, that we had a kind of general understanding the three types of data governance. First, it's uh, the left side, the EU. This is a human-centric approach of human rights. It's a fundamental right of the EU constitution. And they, they just, the uh, EU is more kind of the promoting the, you know, the um, more for protecting the human rights and then also the uh, fair competition and then um, platform content moderation. So that all stakeholders equal the benefit from the digital economy. And they, the opposite, um, the opposite, or the kind of sort of the contrast, is the U U.S. type of approach. This is market-driven approach. Um, so that gives really minimum, or almost zero, you know, government uh, intervention, and the market everything, and um, giving the kind of freedom to conduct business. So free economy, digital economy. 
and then giving a kind of self-regulatory framework regime. That is but a base of the you know, principle here is free speech. It's not a little bit different type of approach as a, you know, in comparison with the EU. It's a free speech, it's not human rights, but a free speech is a really key for the U um, United States. And then government is uh, kind of taking sort of the, uh, um, um, the partnership, very close partnership with the uh, big tech companies to promote these digital economic strategy. Then the lastly, China. China takes the state-driven uh, approach. The government seeks to achieve the technological dominance at the international level and then promoting data sovereignty. That means they, the, the, well, the Communist Party, China Communist Party, um, really the promoting strong surveillance over the, its citizens and then um, sort of control people's freedom for the sake of the political agenda or propaganda. So this is the three types, and this, th they are fighting each other horizontally and then also vertically. Um, for example, they, because of tech hegemony, the American companies doing business in China fighting with the um, Chinese government or just uh, um, gave up market, Chinese market coming back to the U.S. or vice versa, and then Chinese companies in the U.S. have to be um, to give up um, the U.S. market because of this um, enhancing very um, the increasing technological rivalry between the China and the U.S. So the, the one thing that's, uh, in addition to these three major the, um, type of the data governance we see in the br on the at the international level, I also would like to add the one more kind of the, uh, the group, which is Asia-Pacific countries. Um, that is, I would say, the Asia-Pacific country is taking the trade-centric approach, I would say. S the, that means over the last several years, the, like in Australia, Singapore, New Zealand, and also the Japan, and then Korea, promoting the um, digital trade agreements or digital trade chapter inside the free trade agreements, and then try to promote free data flow. And uh, with, but uh, the difficulty here is because of trade agreement is something that is promoting trade, it's uh, really the real priority. So the, um, the balance with the data privacy, fair competition, intellectual property rights, and uh, it, that's it's really sort of the second layer of the object, objective. And then the what it's that uh, they are so far creating the FTA is really focusing on the free data flow and opening, openness does matter. So that means now that we are talking about it from this morning, uh, Minister Kono Taro, the, the Minister Taro said, well, data f um, DFFT, data free flow with trust, and um, that is really so, sort of, it's not compatible from the trade policy perspective. This is more from the data free flow per se. So trust, how to just create trust under the trade framework is really now that getting to the very difficult um, point. I think that other speakers may just talk more about the free day, um, trade agreements later. And, um, but the, the thing I would like to say is, as I said, that there is a three type of data governance um, at international, US, EU, Chinese type, but um, this market-driven approach is something that from 1990s, US, 
uh, government. That time is Clinton's the administration promoting internet freedom agenda. And then that's really embedded in the trade agreement. Like uh, the, the one thing is, uh, for example, CPTPP, the provision is drafted by Google, actually. And um, so that, this is really the tech giant. Is uh, what I would like, we would like to do is this way. It's really written in the CPTPP. So this is trade. This CPTPP became the base of the digital trade agreements these days. So on the, um, at the when we just look at the international, you know. Um, perspective, there is a trade agreement, which is a sort of the giving transparency, but on the other hand, the market driven approach. And when we look at the countries by countries, even having the countries among the countries which had a very sort of the deep digital trade provisions, they are taking completely different approach in terms of domestic data governance. For example, when we look at the regulatory perspective, this is the left side up. Um, this is a sort of government's legal regime around the data uses and then reuses. The, for example, CPTPP, FTA, the recently United Kingdom joined the CPTPP, but the comparing with other CPTPP members, regulatory framework that the UK is really the best and then especially the data governance European countries have a very good quality or the high quality data governance so that the UK is really the top of the among the CPTPP countries. When we look at the responsible, look at the, the UK is really 100% but other countries in the CPTPP is almost nothing especially like the emerging countries, like such as um, Chile, Malaysia, Peru, Mexico, it's really they don't have the responsibility. Is uh, they don't promote such as a you know, data charter, responsible AI in initiatives, and so on. They don't have, a, don't have this kind of the uh, law or regulation inside the country. And then when we look at participatory, this is a stakeholders. How to what extent? Um, wide variety of stakeholders participate in the policy making. Again, then the United Kingdom is 100, and then Australia, New Zealand, somehow the Canada tr more transparent, but other countries, not really. The stakeholders cannot participate, are not fully, or ma not at all, participate in trade policy, and not um, data governance making. And then finally, international level, this is a two, that to see to the what extent the government join efforts to establish shared governance mm. rules like convention, uh, the Human Rights Convention. Again, here, even Singapore, which is really the, the lead promoter of the international trade agreement in digital chapter, is uh, they are lacking the kind of human rights protection perspective. So what I, I'd like to say is uh, today the free data flow with trust is uh, something is very important, but still political level. And when we look at the domestic level, also the you know, horizontal um, battle between the three major giants is uh, in practice promoting or implementing free data flow with trust is very difficult and especially the role which trade agreement plays is uh, very limited and also given a kind of a challenging the way that the WTO free trade agreement is um, more that looking at human data protection is a sort of the way to just uh, um, uh, the non-tariff measures we say, the obstacle for the market access. So we don't know this is why that uh, we have to think about how we promote free data flow with trust versus a wide variety of stakeholders engagement. So interoperability is uh, something that we really have to 
start or promote from the bottom up level is not the top down but the norms and then after data free data flow with trust is also the very different interpretation among countries so i stop here So thank you so much. So um, Mineco has given us an overview of the um, issues around data governance and particularly as she has described, you know, uh, how connected to a, they are to digital trade, which is one of the really important uh, frameworks to understand this space. Now we are going to start going through some of the main um, data governance spaces and initiatives in the region and now Jamel here, he's going to um, give us an overview of the CBPR, so I'm going to change the slides here. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. Sorry, no? You have the image, I don't have the demo. Mm -hmm. Same one. Thank you, Javier, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Jam uh, Jacob. Uh, I'm from the Philippines, and I'm uh, here uh, representing the Foundation for uh, Media Alternatives. Uh, it's a civil society organization uh, working on, on that shared space uh, between uh, human rights and, and technologies. Um, so as Javier mentioned, uh, my task, uh, for this moment at least, is to provide an overview of the Asia Pacific Economic Forum's uh, CBPR system or cross border privacy rules system, uh, which uh, is one of, of those uh, mechanisms currently in place that's supposed to uh, regulate uh, in some way the, the, the flow of, of uh, information, uh, personal data in particular. So uh, we are we were we have been talking about data governance. So as far as the APEC CBPR is concerned, it's uh, it zeroes in on one aspect of data governance, which is the flow of uh, information. So uh, briefly, uh, the CBPR uh, is actually the uh, as I mentioned earlier was developed by the APEC. Uh, it was launched basically around uh, 2011, uh, and it is still currently in place, but as I will be discussing in a bit, uh, its future actually is, is quite uh, in question given this other system that has just been launched uh, in the middle of, of, of last year. So what is the APEC cross-border privacy rules uh, system? So in a nutshell, it's a certification system developed by the 21-member uh, APEC group. Um, uh, and th the objective here is essentially to facilitate uh, the free flow of information. So that's uh, a familiar phrase uh, that we've uh, been hearing so far uh, during our short time here today, uh, the, to facilitate the free flow of information, at least among those uh, economies uh, participating in this particular system. Free flow while at the same time uh, ensuring there is supposedly adequate uh, data protection or data privacy uh, measures. So how does the APEC uh, CBPR system uh, work? So if you are an organization uh, that's based uh, in any of these at least nine member economies currently participating in this system, you can get yourself uh, uh, certified rather uh, and by doing so, once you become uh, certified, uh, you are essentially able to, at least this is the idea, you are essentially able uh, to transfer uh, personal data to another um, certified organization in another uh, APEC economy that's participating in the CBPR system. So, uh, so that's essentially the, the benefit that you get uh, if you become certified. Now, how do you become uh, certified? It's essentially through an uh, assessment. And this assessment ha has uh, two components. Uh, the first one is basically self-assessment. Uh, 
you are given a questionnaire as an organization. You are given a questionnaire by one of these so-called accountability agents. Um, and the objective of this questionnaire uh, is to determine uh, how much your data protection policies uh, and, and practices measure up or are aligned with the so-called program requirements. So these program requirements of the CBPR system uh, we can more or less look to them as, as the standards against which all certified organizations uh, are, are assessed or are evaluated. And then, um, once you are done uh, accomplishing this uh, questionnaire, you turn it over to that accountability agent, and this accountability agent also performs an independent uh, assessment. So more or less, uh, it, it verifies or checks uh, how accurate uh, your own self-assessment was uh, in terms of, of uh, your, your ability to meet the so-called program requirements. Then after this two-part process, if uh, the accountability agent is satisfied, it recommends that your organization be uh, granted or be given such cer certification. So it, it recommends to the uh, APEC body, that, that uh, group within the APEC, to uh, provide you with that uh, certification. And then once that is done, your name as an organization and a few other details pertaining to your certification is displayed uh, on the APEC website. Now, just two other things to complete, I suppose, that picture is, uh, who are these accountability agents? Uh, they may consist of private entities as well. Uh, you apply to become an accountability agent with your uh, with your government or whoever uh, within the within your country is is uh, responsible for your country's part or your economy's participation in the CBPR system. Uh, it is possible for a government agency to become an accountability agent, so that is very much an, an option as well. And then finally, how do you become as a, as an economy? How do you become a participant to this system? You also apply uh, to, to the APEC uh, privacy subgroup, and they screen your, your application. Uh, I don't think it, it's that complicated. Uh, we don't have <laughs> enough time to go over the specific requirements. But suffice to say, it has its uh, four requirements uh, as, a, as a country, as an economy. If you want to participate, you comply with those four requirements. And that essentially jump starts uh, the process of you joining this uh, particular uh, system. So next. Okay, so given that this is how the CBPR system works, uh, what have parties so far seen as uh, the so-called benefits of participating in, in this system? Uh, for proponents, certainly, they say that by taking part in the system, uh, as an organization, uh, you are able to present some tangible proof that you are at least committed to upholding data protection uh, or data privacy within your organization, and specifically when you carry out uh, data transfers across borders. Um, it helps also, uh, as far as governments are concerned, uh, this supposedly benefits them as well because it, it more or less identifies which are uh, those organizations that have... Uh, that are more or less uh, likely to comply with their own respective uh, data protection laws in a, any given particular country. Uh, that's participating in the system. Second is it creates a common set of standards. Uh, as we all know now, uh, while the GDPR stands out certainly among uh, this growing number of data protection <laughs> laws around the world, um, there, there is that clamor already to, to have one set of standards so as to make compliance, uh, especially among businesses, among organizations, easier. So by having the CBPR system in place, the, those so-called program requirements, they represent that common set of, of standards. Of course, whether those standards are effective or, or uh, in, insufficient, that's a different uh, conversation altogether. And then finally, uh, proponents also say that uh, this system, this mechanism is, is good because it does not disrupt uh, local regulatory uh, environments. Uh, and by that we mean 
Uh, if you have a data, uh, for example, if, if you use Japan as an example, Japan has its own uh, data protection law. By participating in the CBPR system, uh, it does not in any way change the regulatory requirements of the, of the domestic uh, data, pro data protection law. If, if you are required to perform or to, to observe specific uh, regulatory obligations, none of those uh, change. Uh, you are still required to comply with all of those things, even if you are an, a Japanese organization that uh, is certified under this particular uh, system. Now, with those as benefits, uh, critics and other observers also have noted a lot of, of issues or, or problems with this particular system. One is uh, it's in a, it does not uh, actually provide adequate data protection. The CBPR system has the APEC privacy framework as its main uh, guidance document, if, if you will. And the APEC privacy framework is essentially rooted in the OECD FAIR uh, information uh, principles, which dates back to 1980, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, as pointed out by a lot of critics, while the OECD principles have actually been updated, I think it was in 2013, uh, the APEC privacy framework has not. It has remained stagnant since it was uh, developed around 2003 or 2004. So there's that. Uh, and then uh, you have uh, this small <laughs> buy-in among even the APEC members. So. Uh, APEC has 21 um, members and only nine currently are participating in the CBPR. It actually has a partner system, which is the Privacy Recognition for Processor System. Uh, and, in that part, uh, and that one focuses on data processors. And that one only has two participants. Uh, I think that would be the US and, and Singapore. So uh, I guess that, o that's, that also shows or is indicative of, of how effective this system is if even among APEC members uh, that even half see it fit to participate in this mechanism. Uh, so what signal does it uh, provide to, to others? Uh, it lacks positive influence on domestic laws. Uh, I think many would consider the GDPR as currently the gold standard <laughs> as far as data protection laws is concerned. And this much is, is evident uh, when we see all of these new data protection laws cropping up all over the world and certainly in, in our region in Southeast Asia. And uh, the influence of the GDPR is very much evident. But because of the nature of the CB, uh, of CBPR, of APEC CBPR, wherein it does not supposedly uh, um, change any of the existing data protection laws and does not uh, compel any government participating in the system to change the existing data protection laws. So it has very limited positive impact as well. Um, there is that underrepresentation of civil society. So while this is mainly backed by the government, it requires uh, significant participation by the private sector, uh, especially when we consider that accountability agents actually are mostly part of the private sector themselves. And civil society is mostly left out of the conversation. So if we are talking about the three types of uh, data governance mentioned earlier, uh, one would think that civil society would be the ones to push more for a human rights-centric type of governance. But because they are left out of the conversation for the most part, uh, we, have, uh, we see the, the second type of, of governance more evident here, which is the market-driven one. Um, as far as the legality and enforcement of legal challenges, uh, it also th the issue here also can be traced to uh, the APEC uh, itself. Because the APEC, unlike other regional organizations, it has no charter, it has no constitution to speak of. It's not a treaty. Uh, so any uh, mechanism it develops uh, is mostly con cons uh, consensus-based. So, in, so there are no existing mechanisms that would really, uh, strong mechanisms at least, that would really compel uh, governments to abide by the requirements of this uh, system. Uh, and more so, those, those organizations actually certified under this uh, system. And then there is the question of fragmentation. Uh, 
it, this is actually quite ironic in the sense that proponents of the CBPR system, because they say that it creates a common set of standards, it, they say that it tends to solve uh, or at least uh, helps avoid fragmentation by providing that common set of standards. But if you look at the CBPR itself, uh, because it is focused only in data controllers and you would require another system, the PRP I mentioned earlier, to also deal with data processors. So it is also inherently fragmented, uh, unlike other systems or mechanisms in place uh, that already takes into account uh, data controller, data processor uh, um, relationships uh, and all these different uh, permutations. And then finally, there is that issue of cost. It's not actually cheap to get yourself certified and, uh, it's not act and it was not very easy for us to, to look for actual figures to, to determine how much it costs. But there is this at least one accountability agent based in the US that provides a, a rough es estimate. So they say that it takes an organization over there between $15,000 to $40,000 to get itself uh, certified. Uh, in, in Singapore, they only provide the $400 uh, amount to, to as, as I think it was an application fee, but the assessment fee itself, uh, there is no uh, figure that we were able to uh, secure to, to provide, again, a, a general estimate of how much it costs to uh, get yourself certified, for instance, if you were in Singapore. And uh, before I end, I, I would uh, allocate uh, just, just this one slide about the Global Cross-Border Privacy Rules Forum. So why is this relevant when we're talking about the APEC CBPR? Uh, well, as I mentioned earlier, this, this was established just last year in 2022. And it is important because it is essentially a replica of the APEC CBPR system uh, and its uh, partner system, the, the PRP systems. Um, very much a replica in the sense that the same countries who are now participating in the APEC CBPR, actually the same countries also behind the establishment of the Global Privacy Rules Forum with the exception of uh, Mexico. And then uh, all its elements, uh, at least so far, because they are still in the process of, of developing it uh, with, with additional details. So far, what we've seen is that uh, all the different me mechanisms, the elements of a APEC CBPR uh, have also been transplanted to the global uh, forum. Even the accountability agents recognized under the CPPR, uh, they will be automatically recognized also under the global uh, CBPR uh, forum. There are some uh, small or, or changes or differences like uh, in, in the forum, they now recognize two types of, of, of participants. You have members and then you have associates. Uh, associates are essentially uh, economies or countries uh, that are looking to uh, become members uh, but are not yet immediately ready to do so. Uh, and the example we have right now is the UK, uh, who have uh, actually uh, not just signified, I think, but they are actually, uh, if I'm not mistaken, already an associate of the Global CBPR uh, Forum. And what else? Uh, yeah, so that's essentially uh, why this is critical, because or is at least a very important part of the conversation because if uh, the global CBPR forum actually progresses, uh, the question of, of sustaining still the APEC CBPR uh, becomes very valid. Wh why still maintain the APEC CBPR when you already have this system, a new system which is broader in scope uh, uh, in operation. But for the moment at least, uh, these same countries behind the APEC CBPR and Global CBPR Forum make it very clear that these two uh, systems are, are independently uh, operated. So supposedly they do not uh, affect how the other operates. But yeah, we'll have to look, uh, uh, look again at this particular situation in the, in the future depending on how much things progress as, as far as the global CBPR privacy rules forum are, uh, uh, yeah, what happens to it. If you are interested more in additional details about the APEC CBPR 
uh, and to some extent the Global Privacy R Rules Forum, uh, we already have uh, the, rep the report uh, available uh, on that um, URL that you can see on, on the screen, and you can download it uh, yeah, later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So yeah, we, yeah, we will share the, um, with all of you, I mean, we'll put those uh, URLs in the Zoom, and we'll also share them with you if you, at the end of the meeting, if you want, you know, we'll, we'll give you all the URLs. So um, this was a look at the CBPR, which is one of the systems that is trying to become a global standard for data. Now we are going to um, hear uh, another presentation for another system that is not, I mean, it's not the same, it's not, but it's also being used as an example for what could be an approach to global data governance, which is the Digital Economic Partnership Agreement, the DEPA model. So we are going to have a presentation coming in online from Pablo Trigo Kram Kramshak, who is going to uh, speak from Chile, and I think he will be joining in directly. So I think I'm just going to switch off this yeah. mic as soon as we confirm okay. that we got the audio. Can you hear me? Okay, Javier? Yes, I think we can Hi. hear you. C can you hear me? Yes. Javier, can you, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, I okay, don't. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, well, my name is Paolo Trikramczak. I'm a researcher at the University of Chile, Faculty of Law, and I'm going to uh, present um, some uh, briefly uh, some of the elements and main findings of a report that we are we have prepared on the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement on its approach to cross-border data flows issues. And well, this study was uh, the, has been developed uh, thanks to the support of the Digital Trade. Um, Alliance. Um, well, um, first, some uh, context. Uh, uh, um, in the modern data centric digital economy, as you know, uh, 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 the collection, processing, and sharing of personal data plays a central role, uh, and, and data flows are a foundation of international digital trade. And despite the increasing relevance of this topic, uh, it's not yet possible to achieve uh, an international consensus to comprehensively tackle this uh, the diverse aspect of digital trade at the multilateral level. As a result, it has become more common to find digital trade provisions incorporated into new FTAs, uh, resulting in, uh, in what is often described as a spaghetti bowl on regulation in the digital trade sphere. Um, Privacy and data protection concerns have gained uh, increased prominence in negotiations, but the intricacies of uh, data governance make the landscape quite complex. Uh, what further complicates matters is, is the, uh, that uh, the three major global players, the United States, uh, Europe, the European Union, and China, adopt uh, this, uh, distinct uh, approaches to data governance. You know, there was mentioned before, but other uh, uh, speakers, that is very clear. Um, the U.S. take a sectoral approach, allowing businesses to set rules and step, uh, regulate privacy. Um, the European Union strictly safeguards personal data under fundamental rights law um, and through um, comprehensive domestic um, regulations. And the approach uh, offers um, this approach offers a robust personal data protection and is not open for for negotiation. Um, uh, on the other hand, China uh, has implemented uh, strict regulations for personal data protections, uh, aiming to boost its data-driven uh, economy and internal security. Um, well, uh, the uh, Asia-Pacific countries have adopted some of the most advanced agreements focused on digital trade, such as the uh, US-Japan Digital Trade Agreement, the Singapore-Australia Digital Economy Agreement, the SADIA, and the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, the DEEP. But it's also uh, important to keep in mind that, for example, the CPTPP contains an e-commerce chapter that applies to measures that affect trade by electronic means, a concept uh, not defined. 
including provisions on personal information protection and cross-border transfer of, of information by electronic means, among other uh, uh, issues. Um, well, DIPA. Um, DIPA was um, was signed in um, uh, in 2020 among Chile, uh, New Zealand, and Singapore. And it's one of the first comprehensive international agreements on digital commerce. And during the negotiation process of these agreements, parties constant, constantly refer to, the, to their intention to delineate an adequate framework for the progressive, uh, reliable, and safe implementation of emerging uh, technologies, including the governance of certain activities that uh, underpin these technologies, such, such as uh, cross-border cross -border data transfers. Um, Nonetheless, many uh, DIPA provisions refer to non-binding commitments, starting points, or preliminary roadmaps um, for future um, collaboration. Uh, in this sense, uh, a DIPA has been especially conceived as an, uh, and designed as a pathfinder to influence and contribute to multilateral trade negotiations on digital trade by means of its flexible language and modular, modular uh, structure. Um, it's to be noted also that uh, uh, DIPA parties envision this instrument as a model for possible WTO e-commerce initiatives, as well as digital economy efforts within the APEC forum and other international um, bodies. But what, is the, what are the questions, the main question that this report are, 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 are trying to uh, are, are solve that progress is, is, is that in this scenario, the question arises whether uh, DIPA, one of one of the pioneering comprehensive international agreements on digital trade will be considered a pathfinder in shaping global rules for cross-border data flows. Um, DIPA is frequently considered an innovative FTA, uh, especially in terms of its adaptable design and modular approach. And in this sense, a new parties can determine the extent of their commitment without being bound to fully embrace the entirety of this uh, uh, of this uh, agreement of this uh, uh, its provisions. Well, the key elements of this uh, that we we keep in mind when 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 developing this this report, this, this study, is, is this research is is that. that it's the purpose of this, of this study is to, uh, was to analyze how the DIPA approach can shape and guide future negotiation and international governance rules on cross-border uh, data flows and uh, to determine uh, whether, uh, whether uh, DIPA provisions cons uh, constrain governments from adopting their own standards on personal data transfers identifying the possible added value of uh, DIPA provisions. Uh, when examining uh, take into rules uh, concerning data flows governance, DIPA closely aligns with the um, approach championed by the United States during the TPP negotiation, and that were the basis of, uh, of the CPTPP uh, agreement. Uh, I, even though the United States is, is, is not a participant in the CPTPP, um, well, the, the provisions of uh, its provisions draw uh, heavily from the TPP where the US played a significant role in shaping the negotiation process. Um, this similarity might be attributed to the, uh, to the brief ne uh, negotiation period of, for, for DIPA. It took just some months, uh, which inevitably required drawing heavily on existing agreements. Uh, for future accession process, this factor to replicate the format and the language contained in other agreements, especially the TPP, this, uh, the CPTPP, uh, is Problematic. Uh, uh, countries that are not signatories to the CPTPP may have reservations about adopting these provisions for very uh, for, 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 for many reasons, political, economic, and social. Um, and this circumstance could affect the possibility for that certain countries seeking to join DIPA accept all these uh, its modules. It should be noted that DIPA pr uh, provisions related to governance of data flows contained in Article 4.3 affirm the parties' previous levels of commitment containing in other agreements. This is crucial, this is very important. And among, among, among other effects, this will imply a reference to the commitments made by the three original signatories to DIPA uh, in the CPTPP, to which they are also part. Um, regarding our, 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 our main findings in this, uh, research, uh, we, we, we can uh, see that uh, the deeper rules governing cross-border data flows 
um, take derivative in CPTPP cross-border transfer from, of information provision. Also, firming parties previous notice of commitment containing in notary. As highlighted in our report, uh, this situation can pose significant challenges. Questions arise about which prior agreements will set parties' level of commitments relating to cross-border um, transfers, especially where when um, there may exist inconsistent or contradictory rules at this stage. Uh, the complexity becomes more accentuated when considering countries that are not part of the CPTPP. And um, this factor could affect the chances of new DEPA parties embracing all these models. Uh, despite DEPA personal information protection provisions contained in Article 4.2 being more detailed than the CP, uh, CPTPP text, they fail to set a minimum standards. And furthermore, a DEPA um, strongly promote interoperability through the adoption of mutual recognition and, and mutual recognition of, of voluntary self-regulatory approaches, which could be considered in some way e equivalent to the implementation of comprehensive or sectoral privacy or, or data protection rules. And this in some way affect heavily the impact, the added value of DEPA in terms of protecting consumer, um, consumer rights, uh, user rights in, in, in digital environments. It's difficult to claim that DEPA could be considered a trailblazer for future, uh, future cross-border data flows regulations. However, two, two issues deserve our attention. The first is that because of this, its model approach and uh, uncompromising wording, it's, it's DEPA is an agreement that, um, um, that arose growing interest among uh, different uh, 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 worldwide, you know, in the, in, in, even not just in, in the Asia Pacific Basin, uh, you can see that this, inter this is, is, um, is generating some interest in, in, even in, in Europe, in, in, in um, United States, um, United Kingdom expressed some interest in being part of, of DEPA. Uh, the second is that even if, if, if no concrete commitments are made re regarding data flows, this does not mean that DEPA declarations cannot have any legal relevance. On the contrary, different legal effects could derive from the, these declarations. Uh, especially as more countries uh, join um, uh, the uh, 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 agreement. Um, in this context, it's important to consider that this treaty is inserted in a broader context, intertwined with other trade agreements in which DEPA parties are engaged. And a statement made uh, in the DEPA could be considered in an international dispute settlement, for example, even when the dispute does not emanate directly from DEPA's uh, specific provisions. And moreover, these statements could play a significant role in resolving disputes arising from breaches, reach, uh, breaches of other uh, commitments made within DEPA that are not excluded from the dispute settlement model when the crux uh, of the matter pertains not to correct interpretation or application, for example, of the, uh, Article uh, 4.3. Um, uh, it's worth, in this sense, uh, noting that while dispute settlement models do not extend to uh, Article 4.3, the cross-border transfer of, of information by electronic means, uh, it's, it is indeed applicable to Article uh, 4.2, uh, protection of uh, personal information, which, for example, states in, par in paragraph, uh, paragraph um, uh, 10 um, that, uh, let me check, let me check, uh, that the parties shall endeavor uh, to mutually recognize the, uh, the other parties' data protection trust marks as a valid mechanism to facilitate cross-border information transfer while protecting personal information. This is a connection, for example, if you, you consider the previous presentation for a previous speaker regarding the APEX system, CBPR system that's based in this trust mark with this cells uh, certification um, uh, schemes uh, model. Uh, the same map uh, regarding cross-border data flows, DEPA does not forge a new path, but rather follows the trajectory set by the, by the US. Uh, this circumstance uh, has a decisive impact on the added value offered by, the, by DEPA, by this digital trade agreement. Um, and if we consider that DEPA has been specially considered consider and designed uh, as a pathfinder to influence and, and contribute to multilateral, to multilateral trade negotiations on digital trade, uh, it's not difficult to imagine that a broader, a broad accession or a replication of these terms and provisions could end, uh, end up uh, producing a de facto modernization uh, under the US data governance um, uh, model. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Well, if you want to, to see, to check the, the full report, you can find it in the Digital Trade Alliance website. I'm going to um, 
copy in the um, um, chat section section of, of Zoom the, the complete uh, the link to this report. And well, if you have any kind of questions, please you can see there my uh, email uh, my, my my email address. And well, I'm open to any kind of uh, a question of, of comments. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pablo, for such a comprehensive overview. So we have um, first looked at a system of certification, a system where countries agree that companies can get a private certification and that certification can be used to send data across borders. That's one of the models that we have. The next model we have is a modular trade agreement, but it's not really a trade agreement. It's a, like a collection of um, individual commitments where countries can pick and mix and make their, their own combination. But as we've seen from the research, the, there are some questions as to how that modular approach works in the sense that some of those uh, partial commitments apparently could involve uh, buying wholesale the previous uh, regulatory re regimes of the founding members of the DEPA, uh, which bring us back to the fact that those are in CPTPP, in the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership Agreement, and so they may not be actually that new. No? So that is the, the discussion. Next, we are going to look at the, um, the third model we are going to look that is coming from this uh, region. is something that is uh, quite different. Is the Indo-Pacific Framework for Prosperity, which is a new kind of agreement that is not just a new type of trade agreement, it's not even technically a trade agreement. And we are going to hear a presentation online from uh, Nan from Engage Media, who have been, which is a civil society organization, uh, very active in this whole area in this region. So Nan, could we check if we, do you have access to the um, Zoom? Yes, can you see my slide? Uh, yes, we can see the slides, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much for um, having me. My name is Nan. Um, I'm a digital rights project coordinator at Engage Media. Um, we advocate for digital rights and digital safety in South and Southeast Asia. So uh, today I'd like to um, talk a little bit about um, the IPAF. Um, so thank you for the uh, introduction there. Uh, Engage Media is part also of, of the uh, Digital Trade Alliance. So um, when it comes to IPEF or <laughs> Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for uh, Prosperity, um, this not so much uh, trade agreement involves uh, 14 countries, um, mainly the US, um, India, uh, some countries in Oceania, uh, including Japan and East Asia as well, and uh, a lot of countries in Southeast Asia. And what's uh, very interesting about this um, treaty is that the U.S. government shares all chapters and controls the text of the IPEF. Um, it began uh, a few years back and it is expected to conclude by November um, 2023. Um, unlike other FTA, the IPEF will not offer market uh, access and GSP privileges. Um, the text, there, there are four pillars um, to, to this free trade agreement and the digital trade chapter is not publicly available and negotiation is uh, exclusive and secretive. This also includes uh, enfor enforcement mechanism. Um, although the US will have the ability to conduct inquiries against uh, any violations. Review of public comments processes in Australia and the US uh, and media statements of big tech companies um, have raised a lot of uh, issues um, by big tech companies. Um, the issues that were raised are limit measures that restrict uh, cross-border data flows. Um, and secondly, uh, prevent disclosure of source code and algorithms. And thirdly, remove any requirements for establishment of local offices and local representatives. Um, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada FTA, or um, hereby in the USMCA ex explicitly cited as a baseline for commitments in the IPEF. 
Now, in IPEF, uh, corporate interests dominate the U.S. Uh, trade advisory system. 84% of U.S. trade advisors represent business interests. 69% um, of those advisors represent large corporations and their trade associations. Um, and as you can see, extensive lobbying by big tech uh, companies um, are, are involved and uh, the provisions in the IPF are very big tech friendly. Um, US trade representatives have solicited advice of big tech. Um, we have evidence on that, <laughs> on the digital trade provisions. Um, and to comparable proposals in the digital trade within the trade pillar resemble those found in the US MCA, there could be significance um, on the uh, digital rights in terms of transparency, accountability, and um, the ability to ensure that technology is used in a way that respects um, digital rights. So some of the issues that I'd like to focus on is uh, first, if um, I have um, leveraged the model of the uh, USMCA, um, it will have enforceable uh, cross data flows requirements, generic measures such as um, that of uh, Thailand's Personal Data Protection Act, um, a local law will almost certainly fall foul with the USMCA's style of free flow of data provisions. Domestic measures aim at enhancing privacy and security of data, as well as measuring providing um, regulatory access to data could therefore be affected um, by the these uh, this IPEF provision. Restrictions on cross-border transfer can be used to protect the privacy, of course, um, and ensuring access to enforcement um, mechanism, uh, particularly the um, EU's GDPR and numerous uh, jurisdiction that implement specific measures on uh, pertaining to health, telecom, and mapping uh, or financial data. It will also enhance administrative efficiency and improve domestic law enforcement um, and promote economic and strategic purposes, um, meaning uh, domestic capacity in cost storage, taxation, et cetera. So the implications of this provision will make it difficult to introduce any domestic measures to restrict cross-border uh, data transfer. It will narrow the scope of exceptions. Um, necessity and proportionality requirements um, are very high bars to meet in IPEF. And so uh, the requirements for pre-transfer uh, consent um, could be very hard to, to be met. Um, and, and in the ultimate analysis, um, such provisions help data flow to um, countries where uh, with, with poor data protection standards, for example, the US. And while the debate surrounding restrictions on course border uh, data flow is still ongoing, because while it facilitates states to carry out um, certain elements of, of uh, regulatory work, data localization will also impose barriers on firms for big data on cloud and cloud computing and decision making and lower the efficiency of their operations. So uh, there are valid concerns um, and arguments on, on both sides. Um, next issue that the IPEF um, will likely raise is um, the establishment uh, of safeguard against forced source code um, disclosure as a condition to uh, market access. Uh, countries in Southeast Asia um, and South Asia as well are still developing regulatory responses to the use of algorithm. Um, for example, Indonesia is now ongoing um, with its uh, AI ethics uh, uh, policy. One tool of regulation is ensuring greater uh, transparency and accountability over how algorithms and software in general work. Um, with this provision, it will restrict various tools available to a state to promote competition and fairness in the digital economy. Uh, preventing such disclosure in the future may lead to algorithmic uh, discrimination in areas like employment policies, insurance policies, or search engine rankings, which will have an effect on the competitiveness of smaller businesses in the, the global south. Comparatively, um, uh, the RCEP does not contain an analog, analogous clause and the CPTPP um, 
prohibition on disclosure only applies to source code and not on algorithms. Um, it does not require an investigation to have been initiated uh, or recognize that party may require modification, but in IPEF it will. And so this is um, a trajectory of a, of a, a stricter um, deregulation of disclosure. And um, I'm, I'm quite sure that everyone is uh, aware of the danger of um, algorithm non-disclosure. Of course, they will um, limit the ability for independent um, ex ante verification of how a software product works. Um, it can be essential to ensure that a software-based products and services function as they are meant to do um, and limit the risk arising from the use of software as well as limiting um, the black box um, issue with AI. Um, and secrecy goes against the developing regulatory consensus on the use of AI tools. Um, explainability, robustness, security, and safety are key design principle put forward by the OECD AI policy of observatory. A number of proposed laws seek to ensure pre-deployment uh, verification of software and AI, uh, for example, the American uh, Data Privacy and Protection Act, um, which requires um, to conduct AI impact assessment, uh, including design of algorithms. In USMCA, um, the provision has certain general uh, exception, but ultimately it implies that sort code and algorithms contained in software products not be accessed by a regulator until an inquiry has been initiated into um, an identify malpractice. And that's very, it's a slippery slope. It's also worth noting that uh, the RCEP does not contain, um, again, the analog clause restricting the disclosure, while Article 14.17 uh, of CT, uh, CPTPP applies only to, um, again, source code and not algorithm, but uh, also it does not specifically limit access to source code to instance where an investigation has been initiated. So limiting the ability of parties um, to require changes to algorithm and source code um, that could be found to be biased and otherwise harm individuals um, is, is something that will likely happen um, should this provision be included in IPEF. The non-disclosure could also hinder the trajectory of AI regulation at the regional level um, and also at national level. And uh, I'd like to also uh, point out that there's me um, participating in the IPEF uh, negotiating rounds. So as I mentioned, the negotiations are completely uh, confidential. However, we do um, provide uh, stakeholder listening sessions to which I was a part of in the fifth round of negotiations um, in Bangkok, and I have raised um, a multiple uh, concerns uh, regarding um, the uh, violation of, of digital rights should IPEF take um, the, uh, the North American trade agreement uh, model and the codification of it. Um, and I was, uh, I'd just like to share that after I shared my intervention um, at the stakeholder listening uh, session, um, a US trade representative um, from the embassy actually reached out. Um, however, in that, um, in that intervention, I uh, specifically targeted um, the Thai trade representatives because it was quite clear to us that uh, Southeast Asian nations or, or signatories to this um, trade agreement is not gaining much, but are, are losing um, more. And so um, I, I was targeting the Thai uh, trade reps um, in particular on the digital rights issues. And um, yeah, uh, to wrap up, the codification of uh, USMCA-like provisions will limit the regulatory options available to the signatories to implement public or consumer interest regulation over the digital ecosystem. Um, the free flow of data clauses um, poses a limit, uh, the, the ability of countries to implement localization norms um, and the inclusion of such clauses would allow for the continued flow of data to the US where it would be subject 
through relatively lower standard of data protection norms. Um, additionally, provisions restricting access to source code and algorithm um, will limit the ability of regulators and independent entities to scrutinize and um, conduct uh, external uh, assessment or audit um, on the software products prior to uh, their deployment. This has um, many um, challenges, uh, as I uh, mentioned before, in particular, the gig economy also uh, and labor issues. Um, and uh, the limiting the ability to properly audit AI system is premature, so it could um, in the future limit attempts at ensuring safety and security and fairness of AI tools, which is something that I'd like to highlight here. Um, and closing remarks is uh, the FDA provisions that seek to preemptively limit um, the ability for states and regulators to implement public interest or, or consumer interest regulation in this um, digital space is something that um, it's something that we need to push back. Um, and regulatory frameworks concerning the digital ecosystem are still um, in the nascent state in many um, Southeast Asian country. And with technology being rapidly changing, uh, putting these stipulations and provisions in the FDA will restrict the future um, uh, trajectory of how the regulations is gonna um, happen. So these are not merely trade matters for sure, but there are also digitalized matters and must be excluded from uh, the IPEF and future uh, trade agreement. And I'd just like to end with um, this uh, report by uh, the Digital Trade Alliance um, on understanding the IPEF. I'll be sharing the link with you in the chat box. And that's me. Thank you so much. Thanks, Matt. So um, we are going to finish now with the presentations. We want to now give you some space for questions and opinions on this part of the of the session before we move into discussing the um, local context. But if you have any anyone any hands up, no, everything. Okay, so one thing that I would be, I, um, I don't know if you can put my screen there. So one thing we were going to ask is the, if, if you want to, uh, we wanted to get a sense of where, after listening to all of these things and some of the others that we, if you, we wanted to get a sense of where do you think the priorities may lie? I know that not all of you will have even an opinion or an idea, you know, but we just, um, oh, we got a question. I think for the people in the Zoom, if you can use the microphone there, that should go, otherwise they won't be able to hear us. Mm -hmm. Hello, uh, my name is Raul Plummer uh, from Electronic Frontier Finland. Uh, and uh -huh. what I heard, I, I think it was quite terrible uh, that there is al already like a massive trade agreement which is hindering on, on future implementations of algorithms and AI. That sounds like real bad. Um, which were the countries in this agreement? I missed that. The IP, the IPF, um, there are 14 countries. I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's Indochina. between, yeah, from the US all the way to India, not China. Mm. I think that's roughly the idea. Yeah. If, if I may, um, yeah, the IPF um, oh. includes the Asia Pacific countries, Australia, Brunei, uh, Fiji, India, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, New Zealand, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Jeff, no, I just like to say that IPEF is a U.S. Uh, tech, now the strategy, geopolitical strategy of contest to China. So excluding China and then try to make the, you know, pro 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 market, you know, alliances in digital economy. So yeah, I mean, I think that the idea of following the, um, I mean, the money, I mean, clearly there is a very strong um, sense of, you know, data as a purely a economic asset, you know, as a driving the economy, which I think we are going to discuss later with, um, I think we have some colleagues here from the, um, from the Europe, you know, and we are going to discuss like the different approaches that 
to data, but I think that, um, yeah, it is, it's clearly both money, but also as the Minako just said, you know, there is also a kind of geopolitical sense, I think in a lot of disagreements, you know, where you see that it's not just the money, it's also like trying to create um, lines and affinities and, you know, I think the way that uh, many policymakers like to call it is like like-minded countries. That is the terminology, you know, like people who, who think like us. And the UK, uh, where I live, is one of those countries that is now part of CPTPP, is joining DEPA, is joining every Asia-Pacific um, you know, uh, regime they can. So if we don't have any more questions, I think that if we can keep in mind uh, those um, frameworks, and there is more, I mean, we, could, we don't want to, you know, discuss, but there are also issues around the, um, what the proposals that the Japanese government put at the G7 for the data free flow with trust, which uh, we cannot fully explain because they, no one at the moment really knows what they, <laughs> what they are in detail, you know, or they are not codified like this, but roughly they would be a sense of all the things that we discussed, you know, how do you create uh, interoperability of uh, data regimes, how can you send data, ideally with some safeguards, but the devil is in the detail, as they say in English, you know, it's really okay, what safeguards, you know, who is watching, you know, the, um, who is in charge of controlling the enforcing and safeguards. But I think that that is the, um, that is the context, and I think that as we've seen, uh, the Asia Pacific region is right now like a whole, a hotbed of uh, initiatives that are being taken all around the world. I mean, people in the UK, in the US, in Canada, they are looking at the um, DEPA, for example, as a model, for example, uh, for the how the whole of the new future of trade could function, you know, because when things get stuck, let's just make it modular. And you are looking at the certification, you know, if it's very hard to get an European Union um, decision, let's go for certification. So these models are really becoming global. They are going way beyond the, um, the region. But now that we, um, if we don't have any more questions, the we are going to move into the next uh, part of the discussion, which is to try to, so we've mapped the kind of regional initiatives. Now what we want to do, we are going to do like a little tour of the region where we are going to get representatives from consumer um, and digital rights uh, groups to give us a little context of what are the more pressing issues so we can see how these regulations you know, will basically touch the reality on the ground in like some of the key countries. We don't have the people from all the countries, so don't feel, you know, if you are from a country in the region and there's no one here, you know, uh, it's not by design, it's probably because we couldn't find, but of course feel free later on to uh, speak. And I think the idea is that we want this to be participatory and to get your, your input. And the same thing for our colleagues online. If you want to raise uh, any questions, please tell the, um, put it in the chat, and then we will get someone to read it out for you here in the room. So um, I'm going to, uh, we are going to start with uh, Japan, and I'm going to give the floor to um, Amy Kato from Consumer Japan to start giving us an overview, and then we'll continue with uh, Korea, and then the Philippines, and then we are going to, yeah? Okay, we are being asked about having a break. Um, yeah, okay, so let's do this thing. We are going to take a break because I think three hours, you know, it's like, you know, I can see that no one is as committed to the cause here <laughs> to sit for three hours, you know. So we'll take, should we take, uh, being realistic, is should we say we'll reconvene at quarter past and hopefully, you know, we know who you are. If I see you out there later, you know, there's <laughs> not, and you didn't come back, you know, I'm gonna be like <laughs> pointing at you. So we are going to take a little break so you can grab some water, maybe go to the restrooms, and then we'll reconvene at quarter past. Now, can you hear me? Yes. So in the next uh, part of the session, we are going to have a series of uh, short, stress, short presentations, Lo many presentations, but short and dynamic, trying to give an overview of what are, um, what's going on basically in like some of the countries. So we are going to have some speakers first from Japan and South Korea. And then we are going to have some also a couple more interventions around the Philippines and Europe. And then also some colleagues are going to give an overview from Taiwan um, via Zoom in the after the, um, after the
after a second, but we'll give you instructions. So without further ado, I will let the, our colleagues, you know, yeah. Thank you, Javier. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kugimiya from Consumers Japan. We've heard some presentations about different models of internet governance, and now we'd like to give you some information about the issues that consumers' uh, organizations in Japan are currently fa uh, focusing on. Not only digital issues, but other issues as well. Uh, today, under the title uh, Consumer Protection in Digital Society, I would like to talk about the current situation of consumer administration in Japan and the concerns that we as consumers organizations have regarding the digital society. I will be in charge of the first half of this presentation and Ms. Kato uh, will be in charge of the second half. So I will let you know in advance. There are many consumer organizations in Japan and among them Consumers Japan, CJ, is a federated organization that promotes collaboration and cooperation among consumer organizations. CJ deals with a wide range of topics, including uh, digital rights, food safety, product safety, environment, clean energy, etc. CJ supports the promotion of our consumer policy through workshops and advocacy ad activities. We also attended the consumer dialogue held for the first time at the WTO in 2019 and made recommendations regarding consumer protection in the digital society, uh, particularly the importance of consumer redress and the need for new measures. The global committee within CJ promotes cooperation with CI and collaboration with overseas consumer organizations. Japan is en entering a super aging society. The population aged 65 and over is 28.6%, the highest in the world. As a result, many consumer harms occur among, among elderly consumers, which has become a social issue. Especially in the digital field, it is necessary to increase digital literacy of older people. Um, additionally, the Consumer Affairs Agency has only been in place for 14 years, so it does not have a long history like the EU or the US. For this reason, Japan's consumer policy is characterized by its implement implementation in a reactive manner reflecting the situation in other countries. Especially in the digital field, there are delays in the application of domestic laws. Furthermore, as I mentioned earlier, the wave of a super aging society is affecting consumer groups as well. The members of consumer organizations are aging, and at the same time, Many of the younger generations live in households where both parents work, making it difficult to uh, develop consumer movements as before. Consumers' lack of knowledge in terms of te technology and information in the digital field. Deciding how to resolve issues in the digital field is a major challenge for consumer organizations as well. Thank you, Etsuko. Um, I'll continue the presentation. Um, for us, the internet and smartphones have now become essential tools in our lives. We use the internet every day, just like we use electricity and water. In other words, we can no longer escape from internet searches. However, it has become too late for us to realize that this phenomenon is an invasion of our privacy. In Japan, the numbers, number of users of the social networking service called LINE exceeds 95 million, and the daily 
active user rate is 86%. In 2021, a big problem was found out. Our communication data and photos in this application were available for viewing in two other countries. We, the consumers, were, were not informed of this. We also see a lot of unfair marketing. A law regulating stealth marketing came into effect on October 1st of this year. Stricter advertising will be required and criminal penalties will be imposed if the advertisements are malicious. However, a private survey shows only 10% of companies have completed retroactive measures, including all, posts, all past posts. In order to strengthen monitoring, the Consumer Affairs Agency had set up a reporting desk and is calling for information. Also legal measures against techniques called dark patterns are also um, insufficient. We see many fraudulent methods, including cases where subscription contracts are concluded without the, the consumer's consent, and cases where cancellations is not cancellation is not possible even after all efforts are made. In addition to this, there are many other problems. Virtual space laws are just beginning to be discussed. Um, froze to people with disabilities within dating apps is serious. There are no borders in digital society. This makes it easy for unfair services and defective products to be supplied across borders. And of course, our private data could be compromised if there's no effective rule. In light of this situation, we must carefully consider effective cross-border consumer protection. First, we need to say that we do not accept any services that violate our privacy and security. In the unlikely event that we suffer damage, we must be able to request simple and easy remedies and disclosure. In addition, I believe some kind of legal regulation is necessary regarding terms of use that deceive consumers. We believe that consumers should actively participate in this series of deliberations and should have the opportunity to express their opinions. What we must pay close attention to is the fact that there is currently no international redress system for cross-border consumer issues. I'm always thinking about whether it would be possible to establish new international consumer protection rule that multinational companies should follow or to create a new redress system within ISPIN, um, International Consumer Protection and Enforcement Network. I also think it would be a good idea to try to establish an organization within the United Nations that handles consumer protection independently. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to discuss consumer protection in the digital field with you today. I hope this, prese I hope this presentation will contribute to the discussion. Thank you very much. We are going to um, uh, listen to the perspective of um, like the internet users and, and digital rights. Okay, um, but my present, oh. uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Masayuki Hatta. Um, let me introduce uh, our organization. It's called Miao. Uh, and uh, today I'd like to talk about the challenges or lessons learned uh, in the internet activism in Japan. So this is the website of our organization. Uh, the address is uh, meow.jp. Um, so our, our organization is established in 2007, time flies. And uh, this organization uh, modeled after uh, electronic, electronic, electronic Frontier Foundation, or ORG, in the UK. 
So our main focus um, on the internet freedom and uh, mainly freedom of speech expression or uh, especially copyright issues, copyright regulation issues. So we are not really a consumer, consumer organization, but uh, uh, our focus is overlapped uh, with uh, consumer organization. And sometimes we worked with uh, Japanese uh, really consumer organizations like Shufren or something like that. And uh, so what we, uh, we are doing is basically uh, submitting public comments uh, to the government or sending our members to government committees, something like that. So uh, what we face were the difficulties. Uh, one is uh, general indifference. So in Japan and maybe in the, uh, in the other countries, uh, for example, privacy issues, uh, there is a strong uh, sentiment of nothing to hide. So we are doing great and we don't have nothing to hide. So some, some people, if some people want to hide something, they must be a criminal or something. And uh, also, I think there is a, um, how can I say, uh, systemic bias or maybe under underestimation bias, I call, because uh, one person's data isn't worth much, so no, many people uh, are not really care about their privacy, but if there are many people's data, many people's data increases in the value exponentially. I think this is the basic mechanics of uh, general indifference in, in privacy issues. And also in Japan, um, there are strong sentiments that um, avoidance of, of activism in general or politics or maybe uh, we have really conformist culture. Also, um, the second challenge is uh, a lack of mobilization skills. Um, for example, our organization is perpetually understaffed or underfunded. Uh, we uh, depends on we depends on the uh, uh, contributions, uh, but uh, still we don't have no paid full time staff because I, I have my day job. Uh, I'm not really full time staff, and also uh, in generally speaking, in Japan the activism uh, internet activism in general in Japan uh, not well organized, uh, so pretty much individual efforts. And uh, also, uh, uh, I think uh, we don't have good horizontal connection. I mean, the uh, communication between the organizations or something uh, quite scarce. And uh, but there is there was notable exception. Uh, there was a, a, a strong anti-DNS blocking movement in 2018. Uh, we could uh, organize a coalition. Uh, among coalition among uh, government officials, uh, activists, academics, or ISP, or I, I mean private sectors. So uh, yeah, sometimes we can uh, organize um, some uh, horizontal coalition, but not usually. Um, also, I think um, Japanese activism uh, have some kind of political bias. Uh, I say um, there are too much left-wing leanings, uh, which means uh, um, there's strong sentiment of anti-government or uh, maybe lack of eff effective lobbying skills in uh, Japanese uh, activism sectors. And uh, also, uh, sometimes uh, we suffer um, the lack of technical knowledge um, this is quite troublesome because uh, privacy or data governance issue is essentially technical issues or technological issues. Uh, for example, uh, privacy issues is heavily involved with encryption or uh, platform architecture or something like that. But uh, if we want to understand the issue, uh, we have to understand technical issues. and. Uh, uh, the skill set of internet activists in Japan 
is not really enough. So you sometimes it's not enough for understanding technical details in detail. And uh, also, I think it's I, I understand this is a kind of controversial stuff, but um, you know sometimes people say uh, justice without force is powerless. So I think we sometimes need to demonstrate um, uh, if we don't we have uh, no choice. Uh, so maybe me, we need more hacktivists or uh, more, you know, um, so-called public interest technologies, which means um, uh, the people who has the who has background both uh, technological and uh, 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 political or economics economics backgrounds and who really understand technology and technology and uh, politics. So we currently we don't have uh, this kind of people, and uh, so uh, this is um, our uh, how can I say uh, problem. Thank you very much. That was a um, really good, um, I think, quite a fairly broad overview of the situation in. Japan from below, from consumer organizations that are working on like a very broad range of issues, you know, uh, but as we say, quite on a general level, to people who are uh, at the more like technical or digital rights end, and even there expressing that there is a need for even more knowledge, for even more connections, more people to get involved, to be able to provide that uh, vital connection between understanding the technology and being able to be effective advocates, as we said before. So now we are going to continue our tour of the region by moving to across, you know, a little hop in the sea, and we are going to let our co colleagues from Korea give us an overview, also a consumer organization, digital rights organization, to give us a broad overview. Hello, my name is Yu Kyung Ha. I am a um, director of from Consumers Korea. So um, first, I'd like to. Um, thank the organizers, um, APC and Consumers International for organizing this very important event. And um, I also, in order to give this presentation, I spoke with um, colleagues at um, Korean Progressive Network, Jimbonet, and also colleagues from Consumers Korea in order to get like a fairly um, general overview of what's um, happening in Korea. So first, um, so Consumers Korea is just like our colleagues in Japan said, we come from a traditional consumer organization. So in back, we were formed 40 years ago. So back then um, it was mainly um, women, ladies who are now grandmothers um, who formed um, uh, the consumer movement. It started from like food safety. We work on a variety of issues, including product safety, um, and environmental issues, but digital rights and, um, for example, financial consumer protection, digital finance, these are the areas that we want to move into, but it's very difficult to move into due to the lack of expertise in these areas. So, so who participates um, particularly in digital rights in Korea? Um, I would like um, group them in three groups. One is civil rights or civil freedom organizations, which is Chamyeonde, um, or in English, it's the People's Solidarity for Participatory Democracy. And then we have the digital rights or data privacy focused issues. For example, OpenNet colleagues here, and also um, Jimbonet um, colleagues. And then we have the consumer organizations who dabble in this area, which includes Consumers Korea and Consumers Union. So we often um, form, we work in each areas, but we form coalitions. We sometimes co-sign open letters and have campaigns together, work against the legislators, work on a spe specific bill um, or, or hold, hold seminars together to form um, opinions. So specifically, how does a so civil society participate? We participate through various w ways, um, government committees, it could be a standing committee or ad hoc committee task forces. What we do is tech, um, we, tech, we try to leverage more consumer friendly government agencies to work on these text right issues 
Um, so we clo closely work with the Korean FTC, the Korean Consumer Protection and Competition Authority, and we also work with um, the Data Protection Authority too. So Consumers Korea has a, a seat. We've had a seat at the Consumer Protection, um, the Data Protection Commission of Korea. So we were trying to put the consumer perspective that um, is built into the legislative and administrative process. And then the, um, we also do consumer research, research projects based on government grants. We work on, for example, um, grants from internet-related internet public, uh, public institutions. We worked on a project, for example, comparing the terms and conditions of national and international big tech companies. So we read the English-Korean versions of Google, Meta, and um, also the Korean Naver, Kakao, the platforms. We read, re read the terms and conditions and see how the different countries, um, different companies um, regulate their things. So what um, the main areas that consumer organizations currently work on is um, it's, very, it's a wide variety of issues. One, we work on the digital economy or the platform economy in general. So ex for example, as I mentioned, dealing with the national, international big tech companies is one. And another area is the data protection, privacy, related um, initiatives. And the third is, um, it's a budding area, it's very controversial, the developing artificial inter intelligence, AI laws in Korea. So we're also working um, a little bit in that area. So the digital economy in general, um, the, so the Korean government's view on the digital economy is um, basically self-regulation is the best um, option is that's what the cur current Korean administration is going for. So the previous administration was more interested in um, putting pieces of legislation for regulating the big tech flat platform economy, but that was um, abandoned um, after the change of administration. So right now it's to maximize the benefits of users, consumers through the development of um, technology and self-regulation of the te those technologies. So. Very recently, the Korean government um, announced a new digital order. So it announced the Digital Bill of Rights. It was announced um, around the timing of the um, UN General Assembly. The President um, Yoon did that announcement in, in New York. Um, and we're also having, the Korea also has a partnership with um, NYU um, regarding these like digital developments. So one concern that we have as consumer organizations, rights organizations, is that these um, digital rights, it's, it's called Digital Bill of Rights, but it is um, spearheaded by the Korean Ministry of Science and ICT, the MIS, MSIT. So basically it's the lead agency for, um, for techno technology development and industry development in the tech sector. So it's not the Human Rights um, Commission. It's not the um, Data Protection. So it's what we're, we're concerned is consumer organizations are we're kind of like suspicious of what is this Bill of Rights. It actually has a lot of other um, not pr protecting human rights is not the, the focus of this so-called Bill of Rights, but actually it has a lot of other components, for example, um, advan advancements in digital in innovation is actually one of the biggest um, focus of this Bill of Rights. And so we, um, consumer organizations also um, work on how to regulate the platform economy, the platform um, big tech companies. So we have um, participated in industry consumer joint council meetings in this um, area since this May. And also regarding the data protection privacy initiatives, so I'll leave that to um, our colleagues from OpenNet. Um, I'll just share like a quick piece of um, developing AI legislation that consumer organizations were invited to the legislative um, discussions. So the, the current AI, AI law that's been being discussed in Korea is um, pro-innovation, pro-business, and it actually writes in the current text, it's um, innovation is the prime consideration objective of this law. So the consumer organizations with the data rights organizations um, wrote an open letter against this um, bill. And we also had legislative discussions with the legislator 
And so we stopped the bill. Of course, there's other things happening in the Korean legislature right now, so the Congress is not really working very well. But um, these are the ways that um, consumer organizi organizations are participating in this digital sector. So I do think that consumer organizations bring a unique perspective, but I think I've um, passed my time, so I'll just give it to the colleagues and I'll discuss later in the discussions. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Song ki -yun. I am a researcher at Open Net Korea. I'll briefly uh, introduce a uh, case that a regulatory system was put to use on uh, big tech platforms. So um, Korea's Personal Information Protection Com Commission ordered corrective measures and imposed penalty surcharges to Google and Meta um, in la um, last year, September. Uh, the surcharges were um, 69.2 billion won to Google, which is about $70 million, um, and 30.8 billion won, which is like $30 million for violating Personal Information Protection Act Article 39-3, Paragraph 1, which is now Article 15, Paragraph 2, that prescribes that um, any information and communication service providers who intend to collect and use personal information of users shall notify the purpose of the collection and use of personal information or particular of particulars of personal information to be collected or the period for retaining and using personal information. Um, Google and Meta did not obtain valid user consent for collecting behavioral information using SDK and Pixels and utilized collected information for targeted um, advertising. Third party behavioral information is collected when users are browsing websites other than Google or Meta. Thus, ordinary users cannot expect or predict which behavioral information is collected on which websites. Um, especially when a platform um, is verifying a user and collecting third party behavioral information, sensitive information can be create, created and categorized and it enables the platforms to track all connected devices. Um, two companies um, argue that they did um, notify the users, but Google did not explicitly notify users about the thir third party behavioral information collection when users joined their service. Um, Google hid it under the more options menu in an opt-out basis. Meta's uh, notification was very difficult to access. Um, it was only vaguely prescribed in the preface of its data policy. And it did not notify um, the matters legally required. And the commission found it a severe violation of the act. Um, again, the February this year, the commission imposed another penalty for violating Personal Information Protection Act, Article 39.38-3, uh, paragraph three, to Meta, because uh, which sub, uh, prescribes that no uh, service provider shall reject the provision of service for um, not providing the information um, that is not minimally required. Um, Meta basically made it on uh, impossible to join the service unless uh, the users check uh, the the opt-in opt in for collection uh, option. Uh, and uh, Meta was again uh, fined and uh, 
impose the fin penalty for not um, carrying out the previous um, corrective measure. Um, that is it. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Joan Son from <laughs> Middle Open Korea, um, the organization which is fighting for the free internet freedom in South Korea. Um, as a uh, digital rights organization, we have been thinking about how to coordinate the Personal Information Protection Act with human rights. So I would like to point out that emphasizing the right to self-determination of personal information and the strengthening personal information protection regulation without detailed consideration of, of freedom of expression can undermine freedom of expression, the right to know, and democracy in the context of Korea situation. Uh, we can say all expressions are processing of information. If an expression is about a person, in, it inevitably involves the processing of a personal information. If all expressions in principle requ requires the permission of the data subject, this will severely curtail freedom of expression and information. Uh, the purpose of the right to self-determination of personal information and the Personal Information Protection Act is to protect individuals whose power is unbalanced with the government or a large corporation from data surveillance by those powerful. Uh, however, the uh, mechanist mechanistic application of the Personal Information Protection Act may discourage the powerless uh, individuals from reporting on the social injustice or public interest issue. And consumer reporting campaigns may also fall into this category. Uh, in, in relation to this, I will briefly explain the issue with the Korea's Personal Information Protect Act, PIPA. Mm. Uh, firstly, a person subject to Korea's PIPA is a personal information controller, which is defined as a person who operates the personal information files as part of its business. Uh, this should be interpreted uh, strictly considering the o original purpose of the PIPA, but right to self-determination of personal information has been uh, over overemphasized and is being interpreted very comprehensively and broadly. Uh, the Korea Personal Information Protection Commission states that any collection of information can be a personal information file if its systemic arrangement can be read uh, and business is interpreted comprehensively. Uh, therefore, even individuals other than companies can be considered personal information controller. For example, it is believed that even if you have video recordings of the criminal activity captured by a black box or CCTV, you may be considered a personal information controller uh, and have difficulty in sharing information vital to others' safety. Uh, and a personal information controller needs to be interpreted narrowly. Uh, as a person who uses an easily searchable collection of information from numerous data subjects for business purposes, considering the original purpose of the law. Secondly, uh, the Korean people separates collection, use, and provision to third party of personal information. Uh, only in the case of collection, in the consent of the data subject can be exempted if there is a justifiable interest of a personal information controller. In other words, the, this is exemption from consent provision does not apply to provision to a third party. So in th the case of whistleblowing for public interest, exemption may not apply. Contrast to GDPR, which does not separate collection use and provision to third parties, but uses a single concept of processing and exemption, exemption of public interest can be widely applied to public interest whistleblowing. 
As far as uh, I know, the Japan's uh, personal information protection law has a similar structure to Korea's. Uh, thirdly, uh, Korea's PIPA provides exemption for media activities. Uh, however, in context, uh, this provision is interpreted uh, to apply only when media organization or media companies report and does not apply when an individual reports to a media company. The GDPR has an article, uh, Member States Trail by Law Reconcile uh, the Right to Protection of Personal Data pursuant to this regulation with the right to freedom of expression and inf information, including processing for journalistic purpose and the purpose of academic, artistic, or literary expression. So reporting to the media can be also be interpreted to interpret it as journalistic purposes and uh, is therefore more favorable to the reporting in the public interest. Uh, against the, this poor legal background, the police once tried to criminally indict a whistleblower with police uh, oppressive investigation tactics. The presidential, Korean presidential office also threatened to file a criminal complaint against the media organization diverging critical information about the office's hiring practices. And the uh, Korean Justice Ministry also threatened to file a criminal complaint against the source, sources of the media articles covering the Justice Minister's uh, confirmation hearings all under Korea's data protection law. Uh, in this way, it, it should be noted that the GDPR allows the collection of information and provision of information to third party without the consent of a data subject for public and legitimate interest and allows exemptions for uh, information processing for journalistic purposes. The personal information protection legislation should be improved to this ensure that the right of powerless uh, individuals to protest uh, and report public interest through freedom of expression or right to know are not diminished. Thank you. Thank you. So we had a good overview now of like some of the issues that are being debated and including like the potential clashes between like the mis misapplication of uh, data protection to restrict free expression in some context. Now uh, we have um, we were going to take a remote um, intervention now from colleagues from Taiwan. Can we get the Zoom? Are they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, we'll come back to the, um, to the room. Can you hear us? Y yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you well. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm seeing the from Open Culture Foundations. Um, Open Culture Foundation is a local nonprofit organization that is funded by open technology communities. Based on this unique background, we aim to promote open technology such as open source, open data, and open government, and the digital rights and the internet freedom in Taiwan. With this community, uh, with this uh, with this community-based background, OCF is also a hub in Taiwan that connects different fields and the countries to make cross fields and the transnational cooperation happen. Because we know that if we want to build up a trustworthy digital environment and uh, defeat digital threats, no one should be left behind. And the OCF is also the APC member. And uh, really thanks for the international uh, um, cons consumer uh, to having me to in this uh, uh, event because uh, it's pity that uh, Taiwanese is can't uh, register in IGF 
since we are not the UN member, but it's uh, uh, to me it's a great opportunity that I can still uh, online and share the uh, situations in Taiwan. And today I want to share uh, lessons learned from the Taiwan RDR research projects. Um, it's an evidence-based digital rights advocacy to the uh, tech sector, and uh, I will talk later what is RDR research project. Before I talk about what is RDR research project, I would like to address in some local challenges and opportunities to you. As Taiwan a post-authoritarian post context, the opportunity is that the general public are highly values freedom of speech, private sector autonomy, and the limiting government governmental control over the internet. I'll give you an example. Uh, in 2022, our National Com uh, Com Communication Commission want to roll out, want to have a draft digital service intermedia intermediary ad. But unfortunately, it's already withdrawn because that no one is like this ad. It, in this ad, it aims to authorize government agency to request informational restriction warrants and the flag, flag misinformation online. As people know that Taiwan is in the frontier of the disinformation and the misinformation. So government, uh, so it's like the uh, European uh, DSA uh, Digital Service Act. The government wants to have the Digital Service Intermediate Act. But yeah, strong public backlash due to the concern about imposing censorship. And also that obsession from the tech companies they think that the notice and the tech gun liability could result in chilling effect. Another thing is that if we regret a message apps, it also could violate privacy and the freedom of correspondence. So in this case, uh, we totally uh, withdraw our digital service intermediate act. And the challenge, the challenge uh, is same as in the Japan situation that the previous speakers also talked about. The insufficient public awareness and the understanding regarding tech companies' responsibility in safeguarding uh, digital rights, as well as the public awareness of the privacy issues. I can give you a two example. The first one is that the surveys from the Taiwan Internet Reports Conducting Pilot by the Taiwan Association for Human Rights, TAR, from 2019 and 2022. 71.8% of people are worried about the data list, while only 48 people percent of people worry about comp company misuse of per personal data. And uh, also that 43% of respondents first believe that a website privacy uh, policy guarantees zero data sharing. So it's a situation in, in Taiwan that people are uh, uh, misunderstanding uh, regarding a tech company's responsibilities. And another case is uh, the, also the, uh, you can say the biggest uh, uh, communication apps in Taiwan line. Uh, they want to, in 2018, they want to update their privacy policy in a, in a to conform with the international standards GDPR. But 
enforcing the public people resistance to their uh, updated, and that's because that the not too not too much people understanding about the GDPR. So that's the background that I want to give you to about the Taiwanese situation, Taiwan situation. And then I want to talk about a report we conduct in Taiwan. It's called Digital Rights in Taiwan. And it's a ranking digital rights report that uh, conducted by the New American Foundation. It's an American think tank. And in the previous, they conduct the global, the international versions, such as on the uh, Meta, Google, and even in the uh, telecom industry like Vodafone and the uh, uh, Orange Telecom. And in last year, they want to conduct the, the ranking digital rights in Asia. So they cooperate the partner in Taiwan in South Korea with the open net uh, friends also focused in the forum and also in the Malaysia. So we are the, uh, their partner to conduct the di ranking digital rights in Taiwan and uh, we cooperate this opportunity also with the TAR, Taiwan Association for Human Rights together to conduct this uh, report. In our reports, we uh, measure 20 high uh, market share local and the regional digital service in Taiwan, despite that international um, ma uh, telecom market like Google, or Meta that's that's already conducted by the ranking digital rights team, and we major in the four industries is the social media and job banks, e-commerce, and the telecom. Uh, we conduct in the three domains: governance, freedom of expression, and the privacy. But the indicator. In the original ranking digital rights, there are 85 indicators in the original uh, ranking digital rights, but we only choose 29 indicators as I show above in the in my slides, uh, because it's more for the local content and it's all for the also for the background from the Taiwan that we are lack of the privacy concerns. So we put more um, effort, more views on the privacy and we want to know about our situations. And uh, it's a view about the national level chance. Uh, it's a compare from the Taiwanese uh, digital service and the EU uh, and the US market digital service. As you can see that the Taiwan got a lower score than the US uh, digital service. And it's because that uh, we are lack of the uh, digital rights regulations such as like data governance and the personal data pro protection. So let this to the low companies compliance standards among the business. In, in our, our report, we observed that the company usually just want to do the compliance to the standard or to the uh, local law. So we observed that if it's an international uh, Corporations such as like Shopee or the Shopee from Singapore or Le Tian Le Tian from uh, Japan, they were got higher score than the local company in Taiwan. Yeah, so this uh, international company they were follow the international laws and international compliance. So they will get, uh, they will treat a good uh, to our personal data and the digital rights. Um, also in uh, during we conduct our research, 
we also have some good uh, strategy and uh, outcomes. Um, in total, we got the seven uh, company respond our uh, report. One from social media platform, five from e-commerce uh, e platform. And also that in the e-commerce platform, two had a meeting with us. So we can have with this evidence-based report, we can have the opportunity to engage them and with this evidence-based report and we can uh, persuade them, we can negotiate them to improve their uh, policy. And also that uh, in the telecom company, one company also have the meeting with us and uh, provide the feedback to us because they also want to have a good reputation in the report. So they also provide us the feedback and uh, try to uh, get a good score in our report. And another good thing is that uh, the good outcome is that a uh, one company, they modify their privacy policy to specify the, that they collect online behavior data from the users. In the previous, all the local company, they just follow our, as I said, that they just follow our local uh, personal data law. So they didn't uh, show up too much what what kind of data they collect, but it did, it, it did, it changes. If we use this report, we can engage with the company and then they also change their policy. So uh, I want to have a like a lesson learned in our, when we conducting the, this kind of uh, report. Uh, the first of is that the international standards and the initiative can attract attention. With this uh, report, and we saw and we talked to them that this is an uh, international ranking of digital rights, not only the local one, and they will pay attention on it. And another thing is that attention from the leadership level yields the best outcomes. As you know, that the leadership level has more powerful to uh, to change everything. So yes, uh, it's also a lesson for us. And another thing is that creating peer pressure, pressure is a successful strategy. In our ranking digital rights, we do our best efforts to follow 20 a uh, company to do the research for, for the 20 companies and uh, in the four fields. And with this result, we found that with the peer pressure, if they found that uh, another company do a good job in that score, they will think about uh, changing their policy and uh, get uh, the better score. Uh, the last but not this is that Policy change requires horizontal cooperation across company uh, departments. In the beginning, you just think that the policy probably making by the law department, but after we engage with them, we found that maybe the CSR department will help us to push other departments to change their policy. So it needs the horizontal uh, cooperation and it need you to find the key uh, person, key members in the organization, in the company and uh, to engage with them and uh, maybe you can do your the digital rights advocacy. Yeah, I stop in here and uh, thanks for having me. Thank you. So now <coughs> we have very little time, so we are going to give an opportunity to Thomas, who comes all the way from the Europe, to give us, I mean, we've been hearing what's going on in the region. Now we are going to put the developments in a wider context. And I think a lot of the references have been made to 
what's happening in GDPR, the gold standard, what's happening in Europe. So I think we're going to let Thomas explain a little bit what's happening in Europe and how things may be seen from that side. And then we can come to it. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you so much. Just one water. Thank you so much. I'll try to, to make it brief, given that we are a little bit behind schedule. My name is Thomas Lohninger, and I'm very glad that I uh, can be here. It's my first time in Japan. Um, it's not my first IGF, but uh, it was really a very interesting exercise to listen and learn in all of the previous conversations. And I actually um, would like to, before I talk about the GDPR and the data transfers, also focus a little bit on the many similarities that I've heard particularly in the cooperation between digital rights and consumer protection organizations. Um, I'm executive director of an Austrian digital rights organization and I'm also in the board of the European umbrella of almost all data protection and privacy organizations called European Digital Rights, or in short, ADRI. And um, very often we have exactly the same level of collaboration where for us um, it is essential to align, to collaborate um, on any issue that is digital with consumer protection organizations because very often we look at the same problem from different angles. We also have different channels to um, exercise influence, to make our case. And um, whenever we are in um, broad or rough alignment, um, there's a very high chance that we can at least get the essentials of um, the, the, the key policy through. Um, another thing that I also wanted to uh, uh, reference a little bit uh, as, as an activist myself, that it always takes those moments when um, the issue that is formerly known as niche suddenly becomes very mainstream. Um, in in uh, Europe, I think there were certainly the software patterns or the crypto wars in the 90s and early 2000s. In my career, it was ACTA, it was data retention, it was net neutrality. And that's when you really um, come to the forefront and the digital issues in general. I remember when I started my career, we had about one law in a legislative term that was truly digital. Um, these days, in 2023, we have around 40 laws every year. And so the, the frequency with the digital legislation that comes out, particularly from Europe, um, is really overwhelming. And it's another thing that we share with our colleagues from the consumer protection world, because us small or medium-sized NGOs and they as big consumer organizations both are overwhelmed with the speed. Particularly if you then look closer and see that um, governments are quite clever in hiding real intentions of certain legislation. And you need to look at laws combined, like this piece looks not really critical, but if you then combine it with a second and a third law, suddenly you see the ecosystem and you see the harm. You see the human rights impact that otherwise would be hidden. Um, and um, not to go, maybe to talk about the GDPR, which is always the thing that the Europeans are um, portrayed for. And I think it's important to stress the historic context in which the GDPR was adopted. In 2013, Edward Snowden released um, everything that we know today about the indiscriminate mass surveillance from uh, the NSA. And that had a huge impact in Europe. Uh, the European Parliament itself uh, and also uh, high-ranking commission officials were the target of this surveillance. And without that heightened awareness, we would probably never had um, a consensus for such strong safeguards. And in 2013, 14, 15, when the GDPR was adopted, human rights was really the primary um, objective and, and, and like the um, the perspective that we had on this law, that's in a way no longer the case. When people now talk about um, these issues, we often use terms like data governance and data spheres, which is in a way to kind of erode those protections from the GDPR. The European health data space would be one example, the financial data space, where Europe is actually taking steps away from the gold standard that it once established. And we even see it in, in another issue that's a focus point of our work, digital public infrastructures. All the things that our governments did in the middle of the pandemic in order to cope with this emergency, and even more medium long term, digital identity, um, digital currencies like the digital euro, and all of these systems also need to adhere to privacy. 
and it's simply not done with, you know, we have the GDPR and that establishes a standard. Now we have to always re-evaluate these standards and make them livable things in practice. What does it mean privacy by design? When I have one wallet that I use for public transport for going to the doctor and doing my taxes. Um, but let's not just look at um, the GDPR itself. I also wanted to give a little bit of uh, um, look back on the debate about data transfers. Um, and here I am gonna be quite Eurocentristic and only focus on the U US data transfers. Um, and uh, you all probably know um, Schrems 1, Schrems 2, the infamous uh, judgments from the European Court of Justice that annulled the treaties with which Europe transfers data to the US. Um, and it did so not from a trade perspective, but from a human rights perspective. It did not even base that decision on the lack of a real federal privacy law in the US. It was the indiscriminate mass surveillance of the NSA where no non-US citizens, uh, non-US citizen has any human rights to speak of, any procedural rights to fight back against this illegal form of surveillance. That is the essence that was violated and that's why uh, the highest court in Europe already two times annulled these treaties between the EU and the US. And to coming back why trade policy still is a welcome frame to have these discussions, we are now on the pathway for Privacy Shield 2.0, so a new treaty between the US and Europe. And that treaty was announced in a trip of um, American President Joe Biden uh, to Brussels to meet with Ursula von der Leyen, the head of the European Commission. And that meeting basically had two points. One is, oh, we're gonna do Privacy Shield 2.0. And the other one was, oh, there's this great deal for American LNG, liquid nitrogen ja gas, that the US is producing that is now shipped to Europe in a time where um, the situation because of the uh, illegal uh, war of aggression from Russia and Ukraine was actually having a huge impact on the energy situation. And so you could really say that uh, the human rights of Europeans were traded away um, to have cheaper energy. And that is in a way, I would say not living up to the standards that I as a European citizen would want our governments to be accountable to and certainly not the ones that I as a member of civil society will hold them accountable to. Um, but it shows in a way that we really have to focus on the human rights essence of data protection, of anything digital, because it needs to come from the human, it needs to be human centric and not centered on business interests, on government interests, on what's technologically possible, feasible or interesting we need to focus on the human impact. That's how we can guide good governance and good policy. Thank you. Thank you. So we have 15 minutes left of the, um, so obviously questions, comments from the floor, anyone? Otherwise the one thing that we definitely would like to talk about is how can we start coordinating. So, I mean, with that, we do have some ideas of trying to um, <clears throat> organize and continue. We saw from our colleagues from Engage Media that were going to the um, IPEF as a civil society delegation, even if they were not able to access the, um, the room, you know, they were still uh, talking to the um, policy makers. We have, um, you know, other spaces. I mean, we did a little online poll, which I'm not going to try to connect it uh, back to the projector. It will look nicer, you know, but uh, just to avoid. But basically, the majority of people who responded said that the priority for civil society engagement on data governance, and that was the barcode, that the QR code we put before. And most people are saying that the cross-border privacy rules, CVPR, are a priority, and also the G20 know, digital uh, track, which is something that um, Consumers International is actually working on in Brazil next year. We have another. And then also the WTO, digital trade, which we didn't discuss, you know, uh, that is also quite a big priority. So um, in terms of, I mean, uh, something that I think it would be quite important is to find a way for civil society and consumer organizations to engage 
with the cross-border privacy rules. There was a meeting, uh, I will add that there was a meeting in London a few months ago of the global CBPR, the forum. It was taking place as the Minister for Data Protection was announcing like massive reforms to the UK data protection framework to move away from, from GDPR. And they didn't mention in Parliament, it, it was the day when they had full day Q&A on data protection reform. The ministers did not mention that, though at the same time there was a global meeting of the CBPR and that the UK was applying to be part of this other regime, which would have been obviously a massive discussion in Parliament. So given that, I mean, that is the level of public discussion and participation that we have in the UK at the moment, you know, about the global CBPR, which is like basically nothing. You know, we found out, you know, I had to go into the website of the US um, Trade Department and find that they had an announcement that the UK and that there was a meeting and the UK was applying. Obviously, they jumped the gun on the UK PR, you know, and we found out through the US, basically, government. So I think that uh, in this context of very low participation, high impacts, you know, one of the things that would be quite interesting for us to discuss is how can we collaborate, you know, with civil society organizations to try to intervene, you know, trying to talk to the government's leading. At the moment, it's like the, the U.S. is quite strong, but I mean, there are many other countries now involved, you know, so I think that it may be even more in useful to find advocates in the smaller countries where you can have easier access, you know, and in, in theory, they have a vote there as well. We can get access to the next round of negotiations. They do have a calendar. And just to say that the global CBPR is gearing up. It has gone from a first year where it was an idea where now there is a charter, there is like, a, and they are actually setting up a permanent secretariat. So I think that particularly a focus on CBPR, that would be quite, uh, quite useful. So, I mean, we are going to be talking about it. You know, we only have 10 minutes here. So um, if we, um, you know, <clears throat> we're not going to put you on the spot to now say, you know, whether you want, oh, we got someone who wants to speak. Uh, hey there, uh, name is Raul Plummer from Electronic Frontier Finland. And um, I only heard about the DFFT uh, first time today. Uh, and, you know, like uh, after this session, I'm starting to get really concerned that all these international trade agreements are going to erode our human rights. And um, I was wondering, like, um, you know, is there any kind of mechanism to, let's say, punish the U.S. if they let us down with the trust again? Mm -hmm. They have already done it. And yeah. if we're thinking of 2.0 nil, um, you know, what's the sort of repercussions for not respecting that trust agreement again? Mm -hmm. And, you know, how trustworthy can it really be if there's no mechanism to sort of yeah. slash them yeah. somehow. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's a good, I think that is a really great point, which is, I mean, I think that the, um, the question is, yeah, how do we get mechanisms that actually have um, enforcement and that, you know, I think that at the point with the, the US is a particular problem because they refusal to, en, en, to create uh, comprehensive uh, privacy laws, you know, it's uh, dragging everyone else, you know, and it's dragging pretty much like the whole Pacific region, you know, and many, and even the, as we discussed, you know, like the Europe. So I think that this is, but the sense that we get from colleagues in the U.S. is that there is a very strong movement of civil society and consumer groups advocating for stronger privacy protections inside the U.S. So I think that my view on this, I think that would be the discussion, you know, is that the best thing we can do is to really work with uh, organizations in the U.S to try to get domestic reforms while showing from all around the world that actually they are the ones that are going to be in the minority. And at the moment, the U.S. is trying to divide, uh, to use really the Asia-Pacific region to divide and say, look, Europeans are the people that care about privacy. This is all region about business and the future, you know, and robots taking care of all people and, you know, things. And we don't need data protection from Europe. And I think that at the moment, you know, what would be more interesting is to say, look, you know, everyone around the world cares about consumer rights, you know, and if you are don't jump in, you are going to be the ones that are standing out, you know. So I think it's about moving the lines of consensus and putting them in the minority, you know, which is precisely what we're trying to do here. So, um, yeah, I think so. Do you want to speak in the microphone so they can hear you? So, hi, everyone. My name is Bridget Kulich, and if you don't know me, 
like uh, I've been talking about trade for a while. Like I think last ten years, like you, uh, you probably heard me talking about the, the the digital trade rules in last IGFs, and I'm the founder of the Digital Trade Alliance. I'm no longer with the the alliance, but um, s I I have few notes here because I've been I've been listening to all the discussion, and this is this is really great because this is this is what we try to do all those years and it's it's really great to see all these familiar faces working on on trade on digital trade now but i i, I just want to to um to clarify a few things like that with the ipf like i know it's a big deal now it's a it's a very big deal here in the in in, in the region and the rules are like i think the the, the u.s tax is is it's not usmca it's usmca minus which is really good and that's why the industry is not happy in the U.S. And I think I can say that this is what I've been hearing in D.C. that they gave up on IPF because they don't they know that they are not gonna get what they want. But there is an another argument which we didn't talk today, the WTO. <laughs> and I think I th I want I really really want to bring the the attention to your attention to the WTO because they can't make a they can't make progress in the WTO because of Europe you know the US and Europe the privacy exception because there is a rule on on free flows right and then there is an exception that's that's how the trade agreements work and all these discussions we are having data flows with trust it's nothing it's the, it's it's like it's a distraction the, the 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 main issue for us is the exception and the EU has an exception language which they came up like a few years ago. No, it's twenty sixteen and it's in the EU FTAs. And I know that for instance Korea has a no uh, in the EU FTA and the Japan FTA does it has a placeholder but they wanna introduce a new exception there. So the problem is the EU and they can make progress in the in, in the WTO. But what's happening now is that's what I've been hearing from Europe. Like they were, they are trying to change the, the European position because if they get the Europe on board, they can sign that agreement in the WTO and it will be like, it will be binding, but also like enforceable, you know, and that's the problem with the trade agreements. They are binding, but they are also enforceable because if you don't comply with your trade obligations, you you end up like, you know, you end up like, you end up like getting like sanctions from 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 the U.S. and other trade partners. So that's is that's why it's very important that we pay attention to these um, these rules, especially to the WTO and to Europeans in the room. <laughs> we really need you all <laughs> on our side because Europe has been resisting. Your Europe, Europe has been keeping its position on 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 privacy exception. But what I've been hearing is there is so much pushback coming from not only the uh, the industry but also some of the member uh, some of the European countries, you know, to revise the language. So I just wanted to give you an update on what's going on. So the IPF is still problem, <laughs> but <laughs> focus on IPF. But don't 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 think that nothing is happening in the WTO. Yeah, I think that was um, just to clarify. I mean, the meeting today we were looking at initiatives coming from the Asia Pacific region. It's not the only thing that is happening. <laughs> you know, there is the WTO, WTO joint statement initiative on digital trade or e-commerce uh, is one. It's an attempt to try to consolidate some of the rules that you find in Asia Pacific uh, trade ag digital trade agreements around the free flow of data and minimal uh, minimum levels of data protection potentially to make it uh, global to bring into across all of the countries of the WTO or at least for well, complication technically not all but you know to make it like a new standard so yeah that's something else I think that um, we are really out of time I think that we I keep someone came in with a sign and I think that we got people trying to who are trying to come into the next um, into the next session? So we are going to we are going to probably stay, we leave the room so we can. But we are going to stand just outside. If you want to come and talk to us about how you can collaborate, or you want to find out more information, get URLs, 
for the report, you know, uh, will be, and thank you so much for staying. It's a very long session, you know, I know, you know, there was a lot informa of information to digest, you know, so, but also, I mean, I will be very happy to follow up, send you written materials or answer any questions. Thank you again for coming. Thank you.